if Boris Johnson resigns or is somehow edged out, as is seeming increasingly likely... I uh, don't buy that, personally. Do you not? No. He was someone ravenous yeah. for power. He was absolutely fixated on the idea of becoming prime minister, not necessarily to do anything. The great game of politics was to win and retain power. I think he rather enjoys being in power. Britain has one of the oldest systems of government in the entire world. But nobody sat down and planned that system. It's composed of numerous bits and pieces cobbled together over hundreds of years as the need arose. I'm John Burko, and for 10 years I was the Speaker of the House of Commons. I've seen our system of government at its best and at its worst, and I'm fascinated by who gets to operate the levers of power and what people do with them. In this series, with the help of Deborah Francis White, I'll be looking at different aspects of our modern democracy, how they began, how they work, and how much influence each of them has. And we'll try to answer the question, where does power really come from? This is Absolute Power. Hello to everyone out there on Her Majesty's Internet. I'm sitting here with former Speaker of the House of Commons. It's John Burko. Hi, Deborah. Hello, John. It's a pleasure to be here. It's an unqualified delight, John. Thank you. This is our podcast, Absolute Power, in which John is going to be my guide. Oh, I'm going to remember that. Unqualified. Not just a delight, but unqualified. An unqualified delight so far. I haven't qualified it so far. No. Um, John... That sounds like a threat. <laughs> <laughs> I may qualify. It's a warning of things to come if I'm not careful. <laughs> it's a portent. Indeed. It may be qualified by the end of this episode. Who knows? But what we do know is John is going to guide me through the corridors of power, those that sometimes seem very elitist and privileged to those on the outside, i.e. us. And he is going to guide you and me through them. Uh, John, thank you for being here and being our guide today. I am delighted. Now, on this episode, we're going to be talking about the office of the Prime Minister. Now, we don't have a president in this country. We have a Prime Minister, so a First Minister. We have lots of ministers in the Cabinet. We think we know what the Prime Minister is. Anecdotally, I think nearly everyone in this country would have a sense of who the Prime Minister is or what the Prime Minister does or what she does. But constitutionally, can you tell us, what is the Prime Minister's role? The Prime Minister is the most senior minister in the government of the day. The office of Prime Minister, Deborah, was not created by statute. That is to say, it's not the result of a law being passed. Rather, the office evolved as this country evolved from a monarchy to a democracy. And the Prime Minister is, in practice, the head of government exercising power ordinarily in the modern age as the leader of the largest party in Parliament, or at any rate, the party that can command a majority in Parliament. The Queen is our head of state, but the Queen is not party political. The Queen does not administer the affairs of state. She doesn't run the government. It is run on her and the country's behalf. And it is run by a government at the head of which is a cabinet, typically of 20 people or maybe slightly more. And the Prime Minister was traditionally regarded as primus inter pares, that is to say, first among equals. There was a time when cabinet government was the norm and many people feel that that became decreasingly the case under the premiership of Margaret Thatcher, who was rather inclined to take the view that she must have her way. And she famously said on one occasion, you know, if I become prime minister, I can't have a lot of time taken up with arguments in cabinet that will distract from my central purpose. In other words, she just wanted to get, get on, on and do what she do wanted what to, what do. to do. And I think Tony Blair took very much the same attitude. Now, we don't vote for our prime ministers in this country the way that Americans vote for their no. president. No, being really pedantic in Not saying this, more you people. don't elect, you don't elect a prime minister. And as you said, you don't actually elect a government. You elect a parliament, 
from which a government is drawn. Is drawn. Now, so some people will think that I'm splitting hairs, but constitutionally, it's quite a relevant point. At the end of the election process, there will usually, not always, be a party with an overall majority. If there isn't, then that party or a party has to try to command an overall majority to conduct the Queen's government. In the present circumstances, of course, there was no issue because in 2019, the Conservatives won by a whopping majority. So Boris Johnson was returned as Prime Minister and with a majority of over 80. And so in practice, he is in an extremely dominant position. So we now sort of see our Prime Minister as a presidential figure, don't we? We sort of see them as somebody who, well, they're the person running the country. But in reality, if Boris Johnson resigns or is somehow edged out, as is seeming increasingly likely, I don't know what you think about this, but there's lots of chat in the press and on Twitter saying he's not long for this politics. Uh, he's not long for this palace. Uh, uh, I don't buy that personally. Do you not? No. They're I mean, saying Rishi Sunak is going to take over. I hear that I everywhere. Think, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. I may be wrong, but I don't think that's going to happen. Why do you think soon. that? Why? I think the Prime Minister's a great survivor. I think the Prime Minister would go soon, only if the Prime Minister wanted to go. Do I think he will want to go soon? No. I think he's I think he's had it. He keeps complaining he can't afford a nanny. I don't think he, I think he just wanted it to be the first line of his Wikipedia entry. I think entry. these are great distraction stories, to be honest. And I think that sometimes there's wishful thinking. I remember somebody on the Labour side with whom I'm friendly saying to me nine months ago that Boris Johnson wouldn't still be Prime Minister by Christmas. And I didn't believe it then and I don't believe it now. Why do you think he wants to stay when it's such a... I mean, it's such a, a tough time to be Prime Minister. He's done it. It will be the first line of his obit. I always got the feeling with him and David Cameron that they figured out at school that they were going to both be PM and wouldn't that be larks? Yes. They've done it now. He he keeps complaining there's not enough money in it. Uh, he is not a popular prime minister, I don't think. He's right. now starting to be seen as this prime minister of corruption sleaze. Sure. He's got more children than he can count. Yes. And or so why would he want to reliably. continue? Why would he want to continue? Well, apart from anything else, he's very competitive. And I may be completely wrong, and I've never asked him, and I've no plans to do so, and he wouldn't tell me. But I think that the reason why he wouldn't give it a miss now, the reason why he wouldn't walk away, he wouldn't call it a day, is that it would be regarded, unless there was a very compelling medical reason, as bailing out on the downward slope mm. and after a, an almost indecently short period. Here was someone ravenous yeah. for power. You know, in fact, he literally lost weight in order to become Prime Minister, not, I think, through stress, but because somebody said to him, well, you ought to look the part, you ought to get fit, you should slim and so on. Not that I'm suggesting that somebody who isn't slim can't be Prime Minister, but I think he came to be persuaded mm. that this is what he needed to do and he got to sharpen up his act and so on. He was absolutely fixated on the idea of becoming Prime Minister, not necessarily to do anything, you understand, not necessarily to do anything, but simply to govern and to be prime minister. I always recall the parallel with Disraeli, Disraeli being asked, what is the policy? What is your policy? And Disraeli thought this was a very peculiar question. What is my policy? Well, my policy is to trust to the sublime instincts of the British people. In other words, anything and nothing. As far as Disraeli was concerned, the great game of politics was to win and retain power. And that's how Boris Johnson sees it. And I think he rather enjoys being in power. And he's been in power, as things stand, for two years, three months, and 23 days on the day that we're recording this podcast. So that is a very, very short period. Now, How he hasn't you know even yet 23 matched. days, John? How do well, you I know that? Well, I think he became Prime Minister on the 24th of July. That is an extraordinary remind you have that you know the days. Or <laughs> I it, may be wrong. Or has each and every day been so painful for you well, since Boris Johnson's been well, in there is power an element that you are that. literally counting well, the yes, days? Well, yes, I know. It, it's sort of seared into my skin like an unwelcome tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you were Speaker, you, of course, had to remain completely neutral on that. Uh, do, do you not have to remain neutral after your Speaker? Well, after you resign, you don't have to remain neutral. No, you don't have to do so. I mean, there's a certain amount of pompous windbaggery in some quarters with people saying that 
a speaker should remain politically disemboweled for life. <laughs> but I don't buy that. I mean, you know, I think when you're in office as speaker, you have to be politically celibate. But there is no requirement to become a eunuch. <laughs> and after you have ceased to hold office, if I <laughs> may continue... <laughs> sure. The line of thinking... Yeah. Having avoided the status of eunuch, mm. I don't see why one shouldn't show a bit of and say what one thinks. Is this the so, equivalent of you showing a bit of leg? Is that what uh, you're well, saying? I was thinking of balls. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I'm no great fan of the Prime Minister. I don't think he's an upmarket decision maker. I don't think he's particularly strategic and he's a very, very poor public speaker. I've always been quite struck by that. He's terribly hesitant. He really struggles in that respect. But he has a certain sort of badinage with the media and the public. And he's got this enormous self-confidence, which I think is very much background driven. It's very much driven by his background in childhood and going to Eton and Oxford. And, you know, he's blagged his way through his career. And it has to be said, you know, that he has been very successful at getting elected to positions that he's wanted to hold. He wanted to be mayor of London. Admittedly, it was a relatively benign period and he enjoyed himself as mayor, but he was mayor for two whole terms. And that's itself a relatively demanding role. It's true he didn't survive very long as foreign secretary, but that was because he made a calculated political decision to leave the government with a view to burnishing his credentials as a potential successor to Theresa May, and that's exactly what he succeeded in becoming. But the idea that he would want to be Prime Minister for only two and a bit years, I mean, there was some commentary on the fact that Theresa May managed to stay in office for only three years, from July 2016 to July 2019. I think she was quite keen to get to the three-year mark, and she mm. did, just by a matter of days. Well, Boris Johnson hasn't even got to three years. As I say, he's stuck at two years. So you think he will stick it months. out? So I think he'll stick it out for some time to come. I think that the name you mentioned, Rishi Sunak, is a perfectly credible potential successor. And he may well be in the lead at the moment. You know, he's probably the favoured candidate. I say probably. One can't be certain about these things. And also there's many a slip, twixt cup and lip. Lots of things can happen, you know, between now and when somebody else takes over. I think if you were to look back to Michael Howard stood down as Conservative leader, which was in 2005, at the start of that period, not many people would have predicted that David Cameron would be the next leader of the Conservative Party. But there was quite a long campaign, designed, I think, by Michael Howard for it to be quite a long campaign, to give someone an opportunity to emerge other than the expected successor, David Davis. So, you know, there are great unpredictabilities in these matters. And don't rule out the possibility that Michael Gove, who, who I'm sure would trade his grandmother either by private sale or a stock exchange flotation in order to acquire the office of Prime Minister, might have another go. He has the advantage of being extremely bright. He has the very considerable disadvantage that nobody trusts him. <laughs> So, John, does the fact that our media focuses so much on our Prime Minister as opposed to our party, does that really undermine the fact that we deliberately have an unelected head of state? I think that's unrealistic. I think there is a figurehead and sometimes a very dominant and effective figurehead and sometimes a less dominant and less effective figurehead. But there's always a figurehead at the top of the government and so I just think it's unrealistic to imagine that the media wouldn't tend to focus on the most senior person in the government, the person who therefore is thought to have ultimate responsibility for its conduct, for the conduct of affairs, for the conduct of policy, for the conduct of the administration as a whole. Does it detract from the fact that we have a party rather than a presidential system? I don't think so, because in a sense, Deborah, every time the government comes to Parliament, 
with a proposed law, it is inviting the support of Parliament. Now, you may well say, well, in the overwhelming majority of cases, it's going to get its way. And that's true because of the size of the majority. But the fact is, the Prime Minister is, however imperfectly, however unsatisfactorily, accountable to the House of Commons. He has to report to the House. He answers questions or not, Mm -hmm. answering them as the case may be, but responding to questions in the House of Commons at Prime Minister's Questions, delivering statements of policy and being questioned about them, appearing in front of the Liaison Committee, the committee made up of all the select committee chairs, which will typically see him a couple of times a year and probe him for a number of hours and so on. So I think it is clear that there is this very strong link between the Prime Minister and Parliament in a way that is not so in the United States. The President doesn't sit in Congress and isn't directly accountable to Congress. Which causes the them way. problems because sometimes they're at loggerheads. And, the and it does cause them problems. Anything done. And, and very often, you know, the difficulty can be that there is gridlock because the president is elected and then a couple of years later, congressional elections take place and there is a move away from the president's party where after it becomes very difficult. President Obama experienced this, but lots of presidents have experienced this. Where after it becomes very difficult for the president to get preferred legislation through Congress. Mm. Sometimes, I'm sorry to say, because his political opponents will simply resolve, thou shall not pass. Mm. And we don't have that because the party is who you elect. And then whoever's running that party, yeah. even if that changes yeah. mid-term, yes, is your Yes, even if the person changes, the party doesn't. Yeah. You see what I mean? There is an argument about, which you hinted at in a sense, you briefly elliptically mm-hmm. referred to it, that we don't elect a prime minister and there was sort of slightly, I thought, left hanging in the air the question, should a prime minister, in continuing the discharge of his or her duties, have to have had the mandate of the public? The answer is constitutionally he or she doesn't have to do so, but in some cases will feel he or she ought. Now, in That means they call an early election. Recent times, yes. In recent times, there are two very clear examples. The example of Gordon Brown in 2007, who thought about calling an election and didn't, but allowed the speculation about it to go on for too long. And it seemed to do him the most enormous harm. Mm. If he'd called an election straight away, he would have been prime minister elected. If he had had called an election straight away, I think the smart money is that he would have won. I think there was a feeling that... He was the natural successor. He appeared to be a very strong character. The Conservatives were still well behind in the polls and he would probably have won. But I think he was haunted by the fear that having waited so long to become Mm. Prime Minister, if he called an election three years before he needed to do so and lost and thereby became, in a sense, the shortest serving prime minister ever, he would never forgive himself. So he prevaricated about it and in the end decided against. But I think after that, he was never in the lead again. And then the financial crisis hit and the rest is history. In Theresa May's case, she professed that she would not call an early election I mean, she would have to circumvent, circumnavigate the provisions of the Fixed-Term Parliaments Act, but that turned out to be a very easy thing to do. Fixed-Term Parliament Act basically said the next election shall be in 2020 unless Parliament resolves otherwise. Once she decided that she wanted to have an early election, she just came to Parliament and a motion was put and she got the support of the House and she called that election. But for quite a long time, for a period of several months after she became Prime Minister, Deborah, Theresa May indicated both publicly and privately, that she didn't intend to seek an early election. I remember it once coming up in conversation between us, and she said, my view about an early election, Mr Speaker, and I said, I'm just humanly interested in the subject. As Speaker, I didn't have a view about it. My view about an early election is that it would not be good for stability, she said. She said, I think it would not be conducive to the stability of the government or the stability of the country. We've got work Strong to do. We should get and on stable. and do it. Strong and that stable. That was her. But I th- and I think now somebody once said to me, "Well, she was spinning you a yarn there. She wasn't telling you the truth." I didn't actually believe that. I think that she meant it. I think she meant it, and I think she changed her mind because the party chairman and a couple of other people in the Tory party 
to whom she listened, said to her, look, this is as good as it gets. You're way ahead in the polls. You are going to walk it and you are going to have trouble ahead with Brexit, with the Scottish Nationalists and others. And you ought to get yourself a bigger majority than David Cameron got in 2015. And eventually she swallowed that and decided to go for it. And she ended up not only not getting a bigger majority, but not getting a majority at all, losing the majority she had bequeathed to her by David Cameron and all the turmoil and travails of the 2017 to 19 Parliament, by the end of which, of course, politically, she had perished. And all of the strength and stability seems to have gone by the wayside. Yes. I think there was a problem with that election campaign, and I don't want to be unfair. I want to be fair and accurate. I think the problem with that election campaign with her as Prime Minister was that it was very much focused on her and strong and stable, Theresa May at the helm, very firm, very strong, very forthright, very authoritative figure. The trouble with having an election campaign based around a personality who isn't Mm. is that that is sussed. It's one thing for Boris Johnson to conduct an election campaign on the basis of get Brexit done and I'm the man of the hell and I'm going to deliver it. Absolutely (laughs) splendid. Absolutely topping. And people might go for it at a particular time and think, yeah, he's my man. The trouble with Theresa May is that whatever qualities she has, you know, charismatic personality, wow factor, aplomb, panache, elan, are not amongst her noted qualities. Yes, uh, we we will we will never forget when she was asked by a journalist what the what the naughtiest thing she'd ever done was, <laughs> and she said run run through wheat fields as a child. I mean, just uh, you look back and you just go, mm, yeah. that's not it's it's not as relatable as it could be. No. But then you wonder if Boris Johnson were asked the same thing. I mean, certainly he would not be able to say legally what the naughtiest thing he'd ever done was. Um, <laughs> God knows. God knows where the bodies are buried. So can I ask you if you could take me through every constitutional method we have to remove the Prime Minister? If I wanted to remove the Prime Minister, if we, if we the listeners, wanted to remove the Prime Minister, what what can we do? What are the constitutional methods we have, if any? Realistically, unless the Prime Minister of the day becomes bankrupt, mm. and even then, not just becomes bankrupt, but falls foul of the detail of the bankruptcy legislation, he or she can't be forced out of office by that means, if the Prime Minister were to commit a criminal offence, depending upon the gravity of that offence, it might be possible for the Prime Minister to be removed as a result. In practice, a Prime Minister is removed if he or she loses a general election, if he or she loses the support of the Cabinet, or if he or she loses the support of a large share of his or her parliamentary party. Those are the triggers for the removal of a prime minister. Can a prime minister, will a prime minister, does a prime minister get removed simply because lots and lots and lots of people fire off letters to newspapers or go ballistic on social media or organise a two million people demonstration or march? No, that's not the way the system works. So the party... The, or the cabinet or the or the the sitting MPs in the party would yeah. have to say vote of no confidence. We don't have yes. any confidence in you anymore. Exactly. And they can get rid of the Prime Minister. They can. Yes. I mean it happened to Margaret Thatcher. Would have happened to Theresa May. Now when I say it happened to Margaret Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher didn't actually lose the vote in nineteen ninety, but she did much worse in the first ballot of Conservative MPs than had been expected, and Michael Heseltine did considerably better than had been expected by the media. And I think her cabinet basically said, Margaret, it's over. Mm. 
loss of cabinet support is fatal. I think if large numbers of members of the cabinet go to you and say, time's up, particularly in this day and age when everything leaks within minutes and sometimes even within seconds, mm. that would become public in no time. And I think the Prime Minister's position would become impossible immediately or almost immediately. Do you think that's why Boris Johnson has such an inept cabinet? Because they know if he goes, they'll go. So if he keeps people around him that won't show a lack of confidence in him because their jobs are dependent on his, him being in power. I wouldn't put it in quite such blunt or Machiavellian terms as that, but I do think there's a sense in which the Prime Minister doesn't want anyone else in particular to shine. I think he is quite happy to be surrounded by people of less striking personality than he and of no very dramatic ability. I think that tends to suit a Prime Minister. Prime Ministers tend to be wary and suspicious of anyone who is too good or getting too much favourable media attention. And they're quite happy if they're surrounded by people who are regarded as absolute or relative dullards. Mm. But Rishi Sunak, he has got some personality about him. Do you think that he's an exception to that rule? Why do you think Boris Johnson keeps him around? Well, that vacancy for Chancellor was brought about by the resignation of Sajid Javid at the time. And Rishi Sudak was, if memory serves me correctly, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury before he became Chancellor. So he was in the deputy's position. And I think he'd established a good reputation as being very competent. At the time the appointment was made, the Prime Minister was in an extremely powerful position. And... I don't think that he would have been viewing Rishi Sunak at that point As primarily in threat. terms of yeah. rivalry or a threat. No. And now I think that although the Prime Minister is still in a relatively strong position, yes, OK, he's facing huge turbulence, but he's still got a large majority. And I don't get the sense at the moment that there's anywhere near to a majority of his parliamentary party threatening to remove him. He nevertheless probably wouldn't want to get rid of Rishi Sunak because that would trigger turbulence and turmoil and a torrent of criticism, which he doesn't need. If Rishi Sunak made some major error or miscalculation and the Prime Minister had an opportunity to remove him and put someone else in, is that possible? Yes, because if you're asking me, is the concept of Prime Ministerial loyalty in this matter relevant, I would say the Prime Minister is indeed loyal. The Prime Minister is always everywhere and without exception loyal to himself. Do you think Boris Johnson does things like go into a hospital without a mask to make that the story? So then we take our that those headlines replace headlines about corruption and sleaze. Is that, is that does that kind of thing go on? Well that is a cynical view, but it may be true because it's quite hard otherwise to rationalise it. You know, it is just so obvious that at a time of uncertainty about the direction of COVID, something mm. of a hailstorm coming across parts of Europe of increased incidence of cases and so on, it must make sense for any body and it's certainly any public person to err on the side of caution and when in a hospital to wear a mask. And even if... It didn't occur to the Prime Minister, as he planned to set out of Number 10, to put on a mask. It will have occurred to somebody mm. in his entourage. It will have done. And so one has reluctantly to conclude that it probably was deliberate. And insofar as it's deliberate, yes, he gets critical coverage, but there is a balance of risk and he may well feel that the displacement activity of getting a bit of negative coverage over a mask, which will last for a period of days, but not a period of weeks, you know, is worth it if thereby other stuff that may be actually important, more damaging yeah, and much more, more important. important. Not that it's not important not to wear a mask in a hospital, no. but it's not, it's not in the same way politically he damaging. He may not think it's as damaging to be criticised well, for not wearing a mask as to having, as having another two or three or four days or very, very heavy headline focus on some further sleaze and corruption sleaze and things issue. like that. I, 
especially as there are some people in this country who might go, well, I don't want to wear a mask either. And he's a man of the people and he's yeah. like me. And I didn't, you know, I think it's all a bit ridiculous. And, uh, you know, it's the kind of thing that might play to some people who would vote for him. Yes. In a way that... The anti-mask oh, brigade, the anti-lockdown mm, brigade. The anti-vax brigade. The anti-vax brigade, mm. exactly. I mean, I think that they're wrong-headed. I defend their right to their view. Yes. To go to a hospital without wearing a mask just seems yeah. incredible. Or sit cool next to 95-year-old national treasure david attenborough yeah, not wearing a mask it's a just pretty it's, stupid and insensitive thing to it's do just really obvious so maybe he is doing that um it's very dispiriting that you say you don't think he's going to go quickly into the night that he's going to hold on because he wants to be as powerful as possible for as long as possible I mean, uh, do i think he'll be there in 10 years time mm. no i don't think he'll be there in 10 years time and i don't think he's i don't do you think he'll sense. win another election I think there's a chance. I think there's a chance. I mean, the Labour Party is now making a bit of ground. And, you know, for people who are hostile to this government, in which category I include myself, that is promising. But I think one has to be realistic about it. The government's just had a wretched period, and that period hasn't yet come to an end. The sleaze scandals mount. And I mean, they're more the than sleaze, aren't rating. they? They are corruption. They are corruption stories. And, and I they actually are quite wish serious. the press would stop saying they're sleaze, because sleaze well, is like... It implies that it's... Yeah, it's a bit mucky, mucky. but it's not illegal. No, no, yeah. no, it's illegal. Some of these are very you serious You cannot matters. do this. It could bring about a shifting of the tectonic plates. Mm. It could, but I think it's too early to say that it will... I mean, I think there is quite a lot of evidence that in the major years, the succession of scandals did do the Conservatives great harm. But that was later on. They'd been in power longer. They'd also lost a reputation for economic competence because of the debacle over the ejection from the exchange rate mechanism of the European monetary system and so on at the time. There were all sorts of other factors involved. And... Of course, John Major had a much smaller majority, so you have this sort of sense of power ebbing away as he kept losing by-elections and so on. I don't think that constellation of factors has yet been achieved in relation to Boris Johnson. And although Labour is now apparently achieving a modest lead in some opinion polls, do bear in mind that for quite a lot of the 2010 to 15 Parliament, the Labour Party under Ed Miliband was ahead, sometimes several points ahead, but it didn't win the election. And if you look back you know, to the 1980s, the Labour Party, when Mrs Thatcher was in office, was frequently way ahead in the polls in mid-term. Mm. But come the election, the gap tends to narrow. Yeah, well, fam so my own view is that they... Labour need to be 10 or 15 points ahead now, not one or two points ahead. Yeah, famously, with that election with Neil Kinnock, they'd packed up number 10 thinking they were having to move out that night yeah. and they had to unpack. And yeah, if you you remember absolutely rightly, you know, there was a feeling that John Major was done as Prime Minister and oh, yeah. Neil Kinnock was going to win. There's always been an argument about the question of whether and if so to what extent the so-called triumphalist Sheffield rally mm. of the Labour Party a few days oh, before the yeah. election did harm because they struck a triumphalist note. Neil Kinnock appeared to be very, very confident, almost celebrating mm. victory in advance mm. and so on. And I think, the, if you like, the choreography of that was very harmful to Labour. I can't prove that, but I think there is a sense that that didn't do good and did do harm yes, to its a prospects. Yes, a bit of a premature ejaculation, if you will. <laughs> I've got some questions from our listeners, John. Go on. Shawzy on Twitter says, who is your favourite Prime Minister and least favourite to work with? Good question, Shawzy. You've put him on the spot now. Good question. Well, I can't really claim to have worked with Tony Blair because I became Speaker after he'd left. He was, of the five Prime Ministers alongside whom I served, the best. He was, in my view, the most successful and effective, but I didn't interact with him directly. Of the four with whom I did interact directly in my role as Speaker, Gordon Brown, David Cameron, Theresa May and Boris Johnson... I found Gordon Brown the easiest to interact with, to be honest. I had a very congenial relationship with him. And I would say that I had probably the least good relationship with David Cameron. Boris Johnson is always really? difficult to factor into the equation because Boris Johnson was Prime Minister for three months while I was Speaker. And, you know, we had a small number of conversations and no more than that. 
And was there any closeness between us now? And clearly he was irritated about not being able to deliver Brexit. And I don't think he was any great fan of the decisions I was making from the chair. But we didn't clash. With David Cameron, there was a considerable froideur. He didn't like me and made very little secret of the fact that he didn't like me. And I was not enamoured of him. I thought that he was capable but facile. Yeah, that's a T-shirt. From Sculch on Twitter... uh, If the Prime Minister has no shame, can they stay in indefinitely? If Theresa May had decided to stick it out through the crises, would she be in the same position as Boris Johnson? No, because if she had tried to stay in post, obdurately resisting the advice and requests of senior members of her cabinet and her parliamentary party, there would have been another confidence vote in due course. My view is that she would have lost that vote because I think there would have been a sense of real fury that she had not responded to earlier requests to step down, which was the authentic wish of a majority of the Conservative Parliamentary Party. However, there's a second reason. Even if stretching our imagination and thinking that she's some sort of conjurer or Houdini-like figure, Mm. she had managed to escape, in other words, to go through that process and win again, I don't think she would have won another general election. I think that... Between 2017 and 2019, the public had seen too much evidence of her incapacity to deliver. And I think people who were pro-Brexit would have been feeling a complete lack of confidence in her. And people who were anti-Brexit would have felt a lack of confidence in her. And I think it would have been a case of both sides of the political divide, both sides of the Brexit divide, for different reasons being again her. Did you ever want to be Prime Minister? No. Would no. you, if you were offered the job, if something, if the if the political genie come, came out of the bottle and said you could, you could be Prime Minister and it, I'd, I'll arrange it, it'll be democratically elected, don't worry. Uh, although I'm a genie, let's skip past that part. Uh, would you enjoy being Prime Minister, do you think? No, I don't think so. I loved being Speaker. I found that the most in- extraordinarily stimulating and rewarding role. Why doesn't it appeal to you? Does it just feel like... So much work and flack enormously and demanding. Responsibility. It's a huge responsibility, a much bigger responsibility than being Speaker of the House. And I just wouldn't have expected it. There was a little bit of chatter at one point towards the end of the last Parliament when there was no overall majority. And there was some speculation as to whether a government of national unity might be formed that could command a majority in the House of Commons. And whether the leader of it would be Jeremy Corbyn or whether, because some Labour MPs wouldn't vote for him, whether it might be Margaret Beckett or Ken Clark. And I think in a couple of newspaper articles it was suggested, or it could be the Speaker, you know, and it would be a very, very, very short-term administration simply to Mm. get through the Brexit period or whatever. Did I ever take any of that seriously? No. You know, at that time... Did it seem like a minuscule possibility? Minuscule possibility. Not but if it had been visited upon you, even for a short term, what would that have been like suddenly in number 10 and having to make decisions and work 20 hours nightmare. a day or whatever? Absolute <laughs> nightmare. Whereas this Prime Minister is ravenous for the acquisition and retention of power and clearly very much enjoys disporting himself in the public sphere occupying that role, I certainly would not have done. Would I have relished it or wanted it? No. I mean, if I'd been really keen to be in with a chance of Prime Minister, of becoming Prime Minister, I would have tried to stay on the Conservative front bench and work my way up the greasy pole and so on. The truth of the matter is that when I was in those front bench positions as a shadow minister, I didn't particularly enjoy it. I served under leaders that I didn't especially admire, none of whom I could remotely envisage becoming prime minister. And I thought, well, whilst discharging these front bench duties as a shadow, and a shadow is very different from being the minister, I'm sacrificing the freedom to contribute on other matters as a backbench MP, which I'd frankly rather prefer to do and eventually when I left the front bench for the last time in 2004 I resolved well I'm not going to come back again I don't want to come back as a shadow minister or a minister I'm going to devote myself to being a backbench parliamentarian and one day I'm going to try to become speaker but did it at any time between 1997 and 2019 occur to me 
that it would be great to be Prime Minister. No. I was really happy to hold the post that I wanted above all to hold, which was the post of Speaker, and to do it to the best of my ability for over a decade. Uh, finally then, John, where would you put the Prime Minister in terms of influence in British politics? Where do they sit on the scale from basically irrelevant to absolute power? I would say the Prime Minister sits at eight, sometimes higher. I would also say that the Prime Minister is at his or her most powerful on the first day of holding office. Mm. I don't say that the trajectory is thereafter consistently downwards. I wouldn't say that, but I would say that the longer a Prime Minister is in office, the more enemies he or she makes and therefore the more vulnerable he or she eventually becomes. And will this Prime Minister eventually become vulnerable and indeed bite the dust? Yes, he may go at a time of his choosing or he may be forced out. That remains to be seen. But the only point I'm making is that I think he's got some Houdini skills. I don't say complete fail-safe skills in that regard, but I think he has some Houdini skills and I think his departure is further off than many people think and a good many of us hope. Is it true that all political careers end badly? I think the line is that all, I think the, all political careers end in failure unless they are cut off at some happy juncture, mm. because that is the nature of politics and of human affairs. So the truth is, I think they in recent times, they have tended to do so. Yes, they've tended to end in failure. Thank you, John. We will be back next week with another episode of John Burko's Absolute Power. Goodbye. Goodbye. You have been listening to Absolute Power with me, Deborah Francis-White. And me, John Burko. Recording facilities were provided by Spiritland and the music was by Hannah Ledwidge. The producers for The Spontaneity Shop were Ned Sedgwick and Tom Selinsky. Absolute Power is part of the ACAST Creator Network and the House of the Guilty Feminist. For more information about this and other episodes, visit absolutepowerpodcast.com. Listener.